All right, excellent. So welcome everybody. Behavior Bites is, I guess we would call this like a season two. I don't really know how you decide like what seasons are, but we took a break because it turns out interviews are a lot and now we're back. <laughs> and um, I'm here today with Morgan Krug who owns Positive Behavior Solutions um, and has been training and working with, um, with multiple species. Uh, for 15 <laughs> years, we're gonna get to talk about Jasper the cat today. I'm very excited. Um, so Morgan has a background in elementary education with an interest in speech pathology and a bachelor's in psychology with a focus on learning and cognition. And so today we are going to talk about the buttons that you may have seen on the internet where there are dogs or other animals, right, communicating using these sound buttons. So um, this is based um, from aug augmented, Morgan, you might have to help me, augmented, <laughs> augmentative Yes. And alternative communication. Um, folks who work with me regularly know that I am prone to trip over my speech. So we're just going to say <laughs> AAC, um, uh, which is being adapted in this. It's not it's not an equal comparison. Right. So this is being adapted. This is a technology that is used with people of all ages who have trouble with speech or language skills. And so we're not using it. It's not exactly the same thing. And there may be some um, um, adaptations that we have to make around the language that we use to speak about um, uh, what exactly we're doing with, with the animals. And so um, Morgan is here today to take us through the work that they've been doing with um, primarily with one of your dogs and your blind cat. Um, uh, and you guys have gone um, viral. Um, I love your TikTok, um, which is very, very exciting. And you have some really cool stuff. There's just so much to get into. Okay. I'm, I'm <laughs> going to do So let's, um, let's have you do the talking. So without further ado, um, Morgan is going to talk to us about this really fascinating um, uh, aspect of communication um, with our animals. So Morgan, thank you so much for being here. I'm so excited. Well, thank you for having me. I'm excited too. <laughs> All right, so um, let's just start with what got you interested. So I, I think um, probably there are a lot of people out there, myself included, um, and I am happy to admit as a pet professional that I have looked at the buttons and gone, oh, that's intimidating. Um, and so, um, uh, you know, and I think people see it and it's very interesting. Um, and there are a lot of conversations happening. It's, it's kind of, um, uh, there's, there's so many avenues we could go down. So Mm -hmm. What initially caught your interest in using the soundboards um, to communicate? How did you get started? Yeah, so I saw, like many of us, when Stella and Christina Hunger first kind of came on the scene a few years back, uh, and it was fascinating, but it looked very complicated to set up, to maintain the hardware. There's, you know, the soundboard, plywood, and these buttons stuck on it. And I figured she was a professional as a speech-language pathologist. Uh, but then I found Bunny and Alexis and followed them and a few other accounts uh, on TikTok and Instagram. And when I saw Bunny last summer use the buttons to press ouch, stranger paw, while she had some kind of burr or something stuck in her paw, I just, my mind was blown and I wasn't sure if it was something that I would be able to train to that level of fluency. I had, you know, no idea exactly what I was doing, but I knew that I, I had to try. I love that. I love that. I think you know, we had talked a bit before you had mentioned like, you know, or, or maybe did I just think this in my head? One of my big concerns, and I think, I think yours too, is you know, what if my animal is in pain and, and they, they can't tell us. And, and I've done other conversations and, and talks around, you know, the subtle signs that dogs. That, right, you know, right. It, it's very early on, we're just looking at like slight changes, behavioral changes, you know, and by the time that we can see something's really wrong, they may have been in pain for a bit, or it may have been more severe. And so I, I love that, that motivation. That's, that's perfect. Um, Bunny's account commented on one of my TikToks the other day, and I Ooh. lost my <laughs> Commented. Okay, so just <laughs> out a little bit. Okay, so you decided to dive into this. We've agreed, perhaps a little intimidating process. So, what was that process in getting started? What was the next step? Yeah. So, 
around last summer, Fluent Pet began shipping out their kits, uh, which made it a lot less intimidating for me because it comes with these pre-made hex tiles that you can then pop the little things out and put in whatever button you want there. So, so this one is play, one of our first ones that we started off with. Um, but being able to arrange it and then just stick the different size hex tiles together, it felt more doable. So uh, I was really excited to get started. At the time, it's much faster now, but at the time it was taking two to three months to make and ship since it was so new. So during that time, I just really focused on consistency with my words, which is something we do as trainers anyway. Uh, but with my blind cat, I wind up narrating a lot. I don't want her to be startled if I'm going to pick her up or give her pets, especially anything handling. You know, I'm giving her verbals ahead of time. And I noticed that a lot of the anxious dogs that I work with frequently, including my own, once they had that predictability, and even just announcing, even if I'm announcing with my body language, you know, we as, as primates can be a little grabby sometimes and, and not always interact in as predictable of ways as our animals would like. So that was something I was already working on. And I think that gave me a head start with the process of beginning the buttons, uh, if that makes sense. Uh, and so we worked on specifically those concepts of you know, when you're being picked up, if I'm approaching, you know, if we're going to play, what we're going to play with, just labeling everything around us, being really consistent and simplifying. You know, I, I talk similarly to how you would speak to toddlers typically. It's not, you know, do you want to go and play outside with me now, my dog? You know, it's Adora in this case, uh, Adora want to play ball outside, hmm, um, is where we're at now with the hmm being the articulated question mark uh, that yeah. they're just starting to learn to start to uh, make requests of me and ask me questions and express feelings and that sort of thing. Wow. Um, yeah, so our, our first kit arrived October, 2020 uh, and we began with the outside button, which being home and during the pandemic, we were in and out a lot. So we got to practice it a lot. Uh, and after about five days of modeling or basically pressing a button saying outside every time we were on our way out, uh, my dogs started to show initial interest in it. Uh, and that's when I went ahead and asked them to start pressing it themselves. Now the jury's still out on prompting. Um, I think it did speed up our initial learning process to once they understood that, hey, this button means we're going outside that they could make it happen themselves. But I really scaled back my prompting after getting that initial press probably twice on her own in Adora's case. Um, my older three dogs, they showed interest in it and they would push it if I was nearby, but they have well-established patterns of communication to tell me what they want. And for me, this is all in addition to our existing communication and never something that's required uh, or you know, privileged over other forms of, of telling me what they need. So they've opted out at this point. One of mine's a little bit interested in it, particularly hitting the pets button for attention. Um, so we'll see, I may have, I may have two dog button pressers uh, in the end, uh, but really it's, it's about just showing them that consistency. So once we got outside, then I added the play button uh, so we could request play outside and starting to kind of build from there. And it became apparent very quickly after adding that second play button a week in that a week later, all done was necessary because play outside became a constant refrain from my border collie. <laughs> um, and in our case, I, just started, I decided to start with our buttons in one central location. Uh, Christina Hunger and some other trainers will start by putting a button by each item. So there's a button next to the food bowl. There's a button next to outside the, the door that they're going through, we'll play near their toy bin. But a lot of dogs seem to struggle with then condensing or they understand the concept more so as you push a button near the item and proximity becomes the cue rather than what 
the button is saying specifically. Um, so I was happy with starting everything in one central location. It seems like that's what's working best for most at this point, but it's also new. And I live in a small space, so everything's kind of close to each other in one central location anyhow. Uh, for people who have multiple floors, some are even creating additional mini soundboards on like the second story so that they can, you know, say if they want to go outside or play a certain thing, but they're more feelings based, you know, ouch, mad, happy, or on a larger central board downstairs. Um, so it, it kind of depends on the household. We're working out exactly what works for, for everyone best still. Um, and like pet snuggles, often people will do near the couch, that sort of thing. And you can record the buttons to say whatever you want them to say. So pets is the command to come snuggle or not command, cue word. <laughs> it's very much optional, um, but that's the word that I use. I think Bunny uses scritches. Um, some people use love you as that. You know, similar to you, you can use strawberries for sit. As long as you teach the concept along with it and you're consistent, you know, that's the more important part. Uh, and there are plenty of people who are doing this with bilingual learners uh, or they're bilingual themselves. Some people re will record in English or a different language first and then a second language second. So the button says both. Uh, and in that case, the dogs are, you know, speaking or not speaking, but they're, they're speaking their language, body language, as well as responding to multiple verbal languages. So they're potentially trilingual or more, which is also a fascinating part of the study. Um, I primarily speak English, so I don't, I don't have data on that. <laughs> uh, fascinating. Yeah. And the way I've arranged it and the way Fluent Pet originally suggested um, is in a Fitzgerald key setup so that it's who doing what, where, and I've also added like a when. Um, so we have now, soon or later, tile. So they're kind of grouped by theme that way. And you can go across the board and hit, you know, the who, what you want to do, uh, when, all, all of that and, and express. Uh, and at this point, my border collie is regularly putting together, you know, five, six different buttons. Uh, now is one of her favorites to add a qualifier <laughs> to uh, more play ball outside now. <laughs> uh, and it's in my own voice. So it, it's very funny hearing my, my own voice coming back and being like, no, I want this now. <laughs> I only have myself to blame for that one. Uh, but I added it because in addition to the all done, uh, Adora is very sequentially based. So she likes to narrate what I'm doing currently, but then we'll also press what she wants to do next. So we have, you know, something like mom eat now, mom work now, then play ball, play tug, play frisbee outside. Um, and often she'll counter with more now. <laughs> but, wow. Uh, yes, it's, but each of these has, you know, this is 11 months into the process and each concept has been practiced. Some since she was a baby, we started this with my border collie when she was 14 months old. And I guess my blind cat was two and a half years when we started this, um, or around two maybe. Um, so it doesn't have to be started while they're babies by any means. Uh, I've had a lot of success with older learners and there's Billy the cat who's 12, I believe when she started. There's Lexi the husky who's seven when she began. Um, yeah, which is, is fascinating to see. <laughs> wow, yeah, that's, it's, it's, you know, like you touched on, it's also new. And so still learning, maybe best practices, but also mm -hmm. still figuring out what is possible. Wow. Very yeah. cool. Yeah. Very and cool. I, I hadn't intended to get quite this deep into it with my cat. I figured she enjoys training, um, but I figured she'd be more limited with her lack of vision than she has been. I started with a food button for her, which is not recommended, uh, but she actually is a leukemia positive kitty that's um, 
what caused the infection that took her vision. And she will go off food occasionally and not eating is one of her first signs of saying that she's not feeling well. And I figured worst case, if she drove me crazy, you know, her prognosis at the time was not much longer. So I figured, oh, that's, that won't be a problem for long if it's a problem. Uh, and, in, and since we're up to, I'll show you her soundboard, because I've added a bunch of different textures for wow. her, but she's got a mom and a door, or excuse me, a mom and a Jasper button, want, moods to be picked up, her food to be pet. She's got yes, no, and questions all done and more. Uh, so she <laughs> has become quite chatty as well. Wow. Uh, and <laughs> yes, and it's really, I think just improved her quality of life in a way that I wouldn't be able to otherwise. Um, the dogs are clearly able to communicate almost everything that they'll communicate via soundboard at this point, um, with the exception of maybe the ouch and, and things like that. But, but cats are a harder read for me. I feel like that is for most people. Um, so it's really expanded and allowed her to be precise about, especially around food, if she wants just kibble, if she wants kibble mixed with her wet food, if she wants just wet food. And so now we have the opposite problem of, she gained a few pounds since we've done this <laughs> and uh, her blood work came back great. And we're hoping for much more time together than initially anticipated. Uh, awesome. But that's been, really, really interesting to experiment with the textures and patterns and uh, basically come up with almost like a sort of kitty braille. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's, uh, it's no wonder, of course, that that went viral. <laughs> I mean, that's just absolutely incredible. Um, and how wonderful, like you said, to be able to have that communication and understand more precisely what the animal needs in that moment, especially mm -hmm. when we're dealing with things like health and appetite, um, things where we might want as much precision as possible. That's beautiful. I love yeah. it. I love it. I love it. She'll tell me if she's all done with pets so that I'm not just <laughs> continuing and her needing to escalate or anything like that, which I think we all have experienced a back off nibble from a cat uh, when we pet them too long and she never does that anymore. She just goes over and hits all done and it's like, okay, you're all done, noted. <laughs> Makes consent testing a lot more direct. Yes, it's so much easier. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it hasn't taken away from our consent test away from the soundboard either, which is a concern yes. that I hear a lot. And I think it's because I never ignore their other communications, you know, even if I can't honor a communication in a moment, in the moment, um, it's at least acknowledged. And, you know, I think that makes a difference too. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you had talked a little bit about, um, or, or we can talk more about, we had been talking before about, um, uh, the precision of that communication and how it can get, um, uh, how we have to kind of go at the learner's pace and be patient and really make sure that the associations that we think are being made are the ones being made. Will you talk more about that? Absolutely, yeah. Um, one step with the modeling is trying to model maybe one word ahead of where your learner is. So when I started with play outside, I might hit play outside and then model verbally ball um, but if my learner hits outside, awesome, we're going outside. I wouldn't expect her to hit play outside since I just started modeling that. Once she was hitting play outside, then we added, you know, the, the ball button um, or tug. And I would, I would model that. But if she hit just play outside, great, we're going to go, you know, play outside. And, and building slowly from there uh, and really going at your learner's pace and being patient. Uh, we don't want this to be any, you know, any, any kind of pressure for them to communicate this way. And our understanding of their understanding of a button can be vastly different from uh, what we intended. <laughs> so similar to how when kids are first acquiring language, any four-legged animal might be a dog, right? They see a horse, then it's a big dog, and they say dog. Uh, 
I've seen some similar patterns with the animals. Uh, for example, when I added a neighbor button intending it to be, you know, because Adora liked to occasionally bark at the neighbors. Um, I added it and taught it while my next door neighbor was outside and she was kind of in the yard between ours. And that happens to be one of my dog's favorite places to play with the cat, uh, with Jasper. So for a while she would hit neighbor and I'd look out and be like, but there's not a neighbor there. And it was her asking to go to that spot where she first saw the neighbor when I added that button for her to play. So after adding uh, or modeling and, and labeling other neighbors that are you know, walking by or in their yards as neighbor, she seems to understand that it's a person, not a place. Uh, though she could still be using it occasionally as a place without me knowing. So it's occasionally a bit of, of interpretation that needs to be done. Uh, and I try to be very careful not to overinterpret, um, but also not let them get frustrated. And, and that's why it's so important to at least acknowledge it and be like, okay, well, I have no idea what you're trying to say, but I'm at least going to repeat back what you said and, and try to figure it out. Um, Another example is with our ouch button. So because that one is so important to me uh, to have my animals be able to tell me when they're uncomfortable, I added that one in February, right after Adora was spayed. And we had worked on the concept of ouch her entire life. Uh, and primarily though, it was modeled while we were tugging, if she would nip me accidentally, misjudge, you know, go too hard. And in retrospect, there's no way for her to know that that hurt me, <laughs> but she very much understood that I was frustrated or annoyed or not, not as pleased as I had just been while we were playing. Um, and she's a very sensitive dog. So, I mean, we're talking like, ouch, <laughs> it's enough for her to be like, oh, you didn't like that. Um, so when I first added the ouch button, it was while palpating her scar post spay and she was on some pretty heavy duty meds. So she probably also was more annoyed at me handling her at that point than actually in pain. So she began to use the ouch button, never once to my knowledge for actual physical pain, but all the time for annoyance and frustration or any time I didn't give her exactly what she wanted right away. So she would hit play ball outside and I would respond with, outside all done, play later, mom work now. And that would get, ouch, outside now as a response. <laughs> <And> then, <laughs> I, I wounded her internally so many times. Uh, and, and some of that could be, you know, breed trait with being a border collie and being a bit more stoic around pain and a little bit more of a drama queen around her big feelings. Um, not that I want to invalidate any of her big feelings. She has some very valid big feelings. The world can be an intense place, but uh, ouch, since adding a mad button, ouch has not been used in that way. So that was a good learning opportunity for me <laughs> to see that uh, there can be other messages inadvertently taught there. But if, if that is the case, no big deal. They keep learning the same way kids do, and we can add more context and more meaning to help them kind of differentiate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That is, uh, that's so cool. That's so cool. It's, you know, and, and we see that in other aspects of dog training, right? Where the dog learns something or makes an association that we didn't intend. Um, uh, sometimes, you know, we can certainly, um, we may not realize that, especially if someone's not a pet professional, they may not realize that there's been that confusion. And so I like this because it, um, well, I like this for a lot of reasons, but I like <laughs> how this really um, kind of puts, you know, almost a human lens on that, right? Because we are communicating in English, like you mentioned earlier, some animals are learning um, multiple languages, which is, yeah. Uh, more just human speech is what I meant. And, and, you know, and so we can kind of go, oh, look, well, this is an obvious to me miscommunication, maybe if we're picking up on those associations. And so we can say, you know, well, that's not what ouch means. Um, so what, what happened here? And I think maybe it's, um, there's a little more clarity maybe around the fact that we need to do some digging there where sometimes yep. there can just be frustration and miscommunication on both ends. 
it makes me think about how many dogs inadvertently you uh, think that part of the down command is touching your hand on on the way if it's been lured so much like oh part of the cue is i i touch your hand on the way down and then when you go to fade out leaning over or at distance there's just that extra step of learning um, and they're, they're so good at reading us and and that's also why it's important to not do too much prompting or cueing of using the soundboard one because i don't want it to ever be a pressure-based scenario or mandatory but also because you know they they could already they they could think that it's whatever you're closest to it's you know what they just want you they need to repeat back what you just said that sort of thing so i try to very much be away from the board unless i'm modeling uh, so that they have the space to interact with how they want to to do so not led in any way by by me or even spatial pressure that i may inadvertently you know, be putting on them, which looking back at early videos, I'm like, oh yeah, I prompted way too much and I was hovering too much. And <laughs> we all, we all learn a lot. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Well, and it's so cool. You guys being part of this, um, uh, you know, not that it's brand new, but really kind of in the broad scheme of things, part of this kind of first step into this. Um, so it's very, very cool. Um, how, what do you think, so there are a lot of buttons there, um, and you've mentioned a little bit about how um, as the learning continues um, and the definitions maybe get a little bit more clear for everyone, um, some buttons are used more often than others. I know that everyone, I've, I've heard this a lot, everyone is very worried that their animal might start just requesting food or to go outside constantly. So um, how, do the, how do the pets, really Adora and Jasper, right, use the the buttons in day-to-day -day life. And, and certainly their most frequent requests at this point are food related in Jasper's case, though she also will ask to be pet, to be picked up uh, or communicate when she's done with something. Uh, I think she's also hit all done while frustrated or annoyed with the dogs. Um, and she's expressed mad and happy as well. Uh, mad when I'm not letting her outside or giving her more food. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so food is, is primary. And again, if, if you're worried about that, just don't add a food button or don't add one anytime soon, uh, or at least towards the beginning of the learning process. And Adora is up to 35 buttons and almost all of our conversations revolve around play requests at this point. Uh, but she will alert to if Jasper is asking to potty outside. She's gone over and pressed Jasper potty outside, outside. Um, she's alerted the other dogs to things that she thinks that they should bark at by pressing their names. Jasper likes to press the other animals' names um, on that. I have a hex tile with all six of our uh, names on it. And she'll attempt to wake us up too by pressing different names and seeing who will get up. She knows Ollie of my dogs is most likely to respond to his name. Um, so it's, it's really expanded our communications in ways that I did not anticipate, particularly between species with the, the dogs and, and cat there too. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's incredible. That's incredible. <laughs> Okay. All right. I'm trying to like, just keep my brain focused and not going down like a million rabbit holes. I feel like we could do like an entire conversation just around that piece right there. Yes. Yeah. Focus. Yes. Focus. <laughs> okay. So I am now, I'm like having a moment. I can't remember when I introduced you. Did I talk about UC San Diego or did I just like, I'm trying to remember too. <laughs> So I, I want to ask you about your goals and next steps. And I don't even know if I've already told people that you are, because I know, right? Okay, guys, do over. Ready? So Morgan, you've had your business. You've been training for 15 years. You're now taking a sabbatical because you are participating in this study with UC San Diego um, around this work, which is mm -hmm. so cool. So tell us a bit about that and tell us about um, your goals and your next steps. It's like the sky's the limit. <laughs> yeah, it's been a lot of data entry since I have very chatty animals, uh, but just 
tracking patterns in which buttons they're using, how they're using the buttons, how long between introduction of a concept to introduce introduction of the button to, to them using the button, uh, to them using it contextually. So I mentioned hmm, or the question mark is the newest uh, sort of concept that I've been working on. And it's funny, my border collie has used it to I've asked, can we play inside now? Hmm, because it's raining outside. I don't want to go outside. And her response was outside, hmm, <laughs> or excuse me, hmm, outside. Uh, so far, almost all of the learners have been putting the question mark first um, in their communication. Yes, uh, there's been less cats that use it, but I think every cat thus far has used it that way too, and nearly every dog. Um, Jasper has started to go over and hit hmm, and then kibble typically as her request. Uh, and today, actually, she hit hmm now for the first time. And then I had to ask, you know, a clarified question of what do you want now? And as expected, it was kibble. <laughs> um, but yeah, so working on continuing with that concept, uh, I've got, I mean, if if I take the time, to actually analyze each video. I've got sometimes three hours worth of data entry a day of, of their patterns. So it's it's fascinating seeing all of that um, and submitting it to the researchers as well as videos to them. And then just trying to get the information out there about not only what the animals are capable of, but how to go about doing this, my philosophy behind it. Uh, so I'm I'm really excited to take the time during the sabbatical to just focus my my energy on this and and I guess the next concept would be body parts. Started labeling verbally while petting my animals, but working specifically on them, you know, saying like, yes, this is their, you know, ear, paw, nose, you know, starting there and getting more specific so they could tell me where their ouch is specifically um and it'll be an experiment to figure out you know can they tell me if like they have an upset stomach or something like that like how even just conceptualizing how to to work on that maybe after a meal while they're more full or feeding them more a certain day and specifically working on stomach it's yeah, that'll that'll be a fun problem to solve <laughs> teaching all of these concepts. But that's kind of my next step is just taking a deep dive into all of this and and continuing to learn more and, and teach them more. So amazing. I think about like the implications this could have like around cooperative care and like yes. I mean just and and just it sounds obvious to say, but really like behavior work in general. I mean, being able to um, really get the information directly from the mm -hmm. animal with a lot of caution, of course, you know, I don't want people to think that I'm, all the caveats that you've mentioned throughout this entire interview apply, um, but I'm just like geeking out at, at the idea, naming body parts, how does this change the way that we um, approach cooperative care and, and our care for our pets in general, that's just Fantastic. Absolutely fantastic, Morgan. Oh my gosh. Okay. So <laughs> that's incredible. I'm so excited. Um, I'm going to give you a chance to tell people where they can find you, but I just want to say everyone should definitely go to TikTok and Instagram <laughs> and there's amazing stuff happening. The videos are so cool. Um, okay. So people have now uh, are probably just like really excited and super hyped on this. So um, tell us where um, we can find you and more information. I know I gave away the TikTok and the Instagram. I'm sorry. <laughs> but so tell us where we can find you. Um, what else do you want everyone to know? Um, uh, and and take it away. Take it away. Tell us. <laughs> Yeah, my handle on social media is positive behavior. So that's uh, P A W S I T I V E, and then just behaviors. Um, my email is positive behavior solutions at gmail.com. If you have questions about getting started with your animals, um, I'd love to chat more. Um, I'm 
learning how to teach this to others still, uh, but I'm really, really excited about it. And even just to point people in the right direction, because uh, there's so much information out there. Uh, and there are some established best practices, but just figuring out what works best for the individual is, is going to be so fun. So follow along on social media to find out more as I kind of unlock there. Uh, feel free to reach out. At some point, I'll have a website um, to go along with all of this that we can link along to. Uh, but yeah, stay tuned for, for all the developments. <laughs> I love that. And I'll put all of that information in the description of the video. So everyone will be able to copy or paste or hit links or whatever the internet decides we will. <laughs> do. All right. Um, where else can folks find more around um, uh, AAC in general? So if you want a deep dive, the best thing that you can do is pick up Christina Hunger's book, How Stella Learned to Talk. Uh, there's an audiobook version too that I checked out through my library, and I love, love, love uh, the audiobook. Um, so, highly recommend that. How.theycantalk.org is Fluent Pets forums and website. They've got great getting started guides on there um, that I followed while learning all of this. And um, Reddit and Facebook have some different AAC groups out there too, but they're not as active. Uh, How.theycantalk.org is probably your best bet right now. Um, and then there's also Talk to the Beans that is uh, a little bit more geared towards cats, but they have modules for foundation learning if you're more video-based. Um, and I think that's $30 for the eight modules. And they have a forum as well, um, though it's not as active yet. Uh, but depending on which way you learn best, there are, there are some good options out there. And then hopefully I'll be a, a good resource as I continue with all of this too. So um, like I said, I'm, I'm happy to, to help as I learn more about all of this too. Absolutely. Awesome. Oh, so amazing. Morgan, this has been fascinating. Um, I have a million more questions. We'll maybe <laughs> Um, but thank you so much for your time and for, for going into all of this and, and the detail and the information and also just the work you're doing. Like this is, this is really neat and I'm so excited what's able uh, to see, see, I'm getting so excited. I'm so excited to see um, what will come of this research, um, the study that you're participating in and, and also whatever else is to come. So um, I will have all of your information in the description of wherever this is posted so people can reach out um, and follow along with your journey. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. This is so great. Oh, I could talk about this all day. So. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you everyone for being here. Be sure to check out, um, again, Instagram and TikTok. Um, there's some really cool videos. It's fascinating to watch um, and to follow along with how things unfold. Um, thank you for being here um, and I will see everyone next time.